Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave. And it could be just you and me. We'll be family. Just wait and see. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to all uh, of you who are able to join us tonight, either live or those who are coming back post-live to watch this edition of tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. I'm Danielle Hicks, Chief Patient Officer here at GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer. Uh, Bonnie, as I'm sure all of you know, is unable to join us tonight, um, but she does have plans to uh, be back once we resume our in-person meetings. For those of you who aren't familiar with our Living Room program, it's a support and education series created specifically with patients and caregivers and the lung cancer community as a whole in mind with the goal of bringing to you live and in real time educational talks from key opinion leaders in the lung cancer community in a format uh, and in language that's really easy for you to understand. So thank you for joining us. Tonight, um, um, we have Dr. Kyle Hogarth, who is Professor uh, of Medicine, Director Bronchoscopy, Co-Director Lung Cancer Screening Program, Medical Director, Pulmonary Rehabilitation Program at the University of Chicago. Tonight, as you uh, may already know, we're going to be talking about lung health and the role of the pulmonologist. You know, not everyone diagnosed with lung cancer um, has a pulmonologist on their care team, unfortunately. So tonight, <clears throat> we're going to talk about that role uh, in, in not only lung cancer treatment and care, but really in you know, some other areas of rehabilitation and, and supportive care. Before we get started, uh, Dr. Hogarth, would you mind giving us a little introduction to you, who you are, what you do, and why lung cancer is a primary area of focus for you? Sure, well, so as you stated, I am a pulmonologist, uh, so my existence centers around lungs, and I am lucky enough to work at the University of Chicago, which affords me the ability to specialize in the things that matter the most to me. And from day one, I have been interested in the diagnostics and the therapeutics centered around lung cancer, the challenges that my patients and many patients face uh, prior to the diagnosis with the uncertainty of a lung nodule or a lung mass. And then the correct and quick management and diagnosis of what stage they are, et cetera. And then helping them through the journey when it comes to the management, whether that is uh, just helping if they have underlying lung disease like COPD, or whether that is helping uh, if they're in a more advanced possibly have things like a pleural effusion and helping to get that fluid out so they can breathe better. Um, and anywhere in between. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that a pulmonologist can add to the management of a patient. And I think, you know, as many people who are on this uh, Zoom and understand, you know, it, it does take a team to help someone through every aspect of their lung cancer journey from the pre-diagnosis to whatever stage they are to then managing through the, the therapeutics and even some of the complications associated with uh, the therapies. Yeah, I think it's really, it it's a really important point and and you know most people i think are familiar with the medical oncologist or the radiation oncologist or if you're an early stage patient you're you know thoracic surgeon but most people don't really think of a pulmonologist which is sort of this hey done now moment right when you really look at the role of of you and the pulmonologist in general who specializes in the respiratory system in the lungs complaints involving the lungs that have to do with lung cancer and or don't. So um, I'm really, really hoping that the takeaway tonight for those who may not have a pulmonologist on their care team to really consider um, what what you and, and uh, other healthcare professionals, pulmonologists like you, bring to the table. So we've kind of broken out the conversation tonight into two different sections. One is what role the pulmonologist or the interventional pulmonologist might play in the treatment of lung cancer. And then um, second to that, but equally as important, is sort of this rehabilitation and supportive care 
outside of that that treatment area. But I want to start um, talking about lung nodules and nodule management. What role do you play in in that area? Oh, we 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 are probably one of the principal players, or in and, and should be. Um, let's start off with the fact that a lot of lung nodules get found and not obviously all of them are going to be malignant but it is the first concern naturally that anyone has if you've been told you have a lung nodule is what is the possibility that this is a cancer and if it is a cancer what is the possibility that it has spread to anywhere else and i think if you're also a survivor of a different cancer it also has to beg the question is this nodule related to that cancer you know that i had before and of course there's a lot of benign reasons people have a lung nodule. So the first component of this is to have a discussion of what the probability of malignancy is in regards to your nodule, and then what is the best way to make a diagnosis, or if it's appropriate, what's the right interval at following up so that you don't have an unnecessary invasive procedure and that we can do a watch and wait approach because that's the safer approach for you and helps you avoid invasive procedures, no matter how safe they are, they're still invasive. You know, it's interesting because I know at GoTo Foundation, we have a helpline and people often call because maybe nodules were found and there is this watch and wait period. What do you say to your patients who might be anxious about what that means? The recommendation starts also with, with size. So nodules that are generally speaking a centimeter and larger are generally going to need to be sampled. Unless, of course, the nodule has characteristics that help you to understand that it's a benign nodule. There's certain radiographic characteristics. But smaller nodules, even in high-risk patients, frequently are not malignant. And I think what people need to always understand, and, and what I frequently say to my patients, is that part of my job is to protect you from me. And what I mean by that, of course, is... Doctors, we do all kinds of invasive procedures. And look, even if something has only a 2% complication rate, you know, I'll make that number up, but your chance of that nodule being cancer is only 1%. So there's a realistic chance that I'm going to harm you in an attempt to prove something that is very likely to not remotely be cancer. And the thing is, if the nodule's small enough, in that short interval between CAT scans, the nodule may grow. It may raise our concern that it's cancer. However, if it was small enough to begin with, the amount that it will grow in that time period means that it would still be the same stage. So what we've gained is you've avoided majority of times an unnecessary procedure, but we've really lost nothing because if it is a cancer, God forbid, in that time period, the amount that it's grown, the probability that it has spread is so remote that the benefit to you, the patient, is avoiding getting needle biopsies, bronchoscopies, unnecessary surgeries. And the thing is, these procedures, um, they are getting better and better. I, I, I spent all day working with a company that's developing an even better tool for the inside to help us sample inside the lung. But it's still an invasive procedure. It still carries a risk. And if you don't need it, I don't remotely want to use it on you. I think that makes sense. And, you know, I, I want to kind of pause right here and step back for a second and talk about um, sort of nodule discoveries and how they may or may not be found. So maybe somebody is involved in a, in a screening program, right? And they are actively participating in their, their health and their health care, right? Via screening. The other sort of piece of this is maybe an incidental finding. So God forbid something happens, you wind up at the hospital, they do a CAT scan or an x-ray and they find something on your, on your lungs. At what point do you, as a pulmonologist, or should you come into this, this, this treatment sort of paradigm? Right then and there. Because it's either a nodule that's small enough that watch and wait's the correct approach, but you want to be and understandably, I, I get why when my patients, I, I frequently get someone comes for a second opinion, you know, they, they, they were told watch and wait, but they were told watch and wait by someone who doesn't really deal with lung nodules for a living. So understandably, the patient is, you know, scared. I get that. And the patient is also wanting the reassurance. So then 
Then they come to see me, start off by explaining also that I'm very aggressive about lung nodules, that if you remotely need a biopsy, we're going to do it. And so if I'm telling you watch and wait based on all that this is what I do, people feel obviously more confident about that. But the other reason you want me here is that let's say that that incidental finding that you just you know talked about is something that actually shows unfortunately something larger and even shows lymph nodes, et cetera, so that the concern that you not only have a cancer, but a more advanced stage cancer. The reason you want my involvement early on is that what I see over and over across this country, which I find very distressing, is that someone will clearly on CAT scan have an advanced cancer. Just, you know, no debate when you look at the scan. And they will send that person for a needle biopsy of the lung mass. But the problem, and, and sure enough, proves it's cancer but doesn't remotely stage the patient. So now they still have to get sent to someone like me for me to go sample the lymph nodes. And we're wasting time. If you'd been sent to me first, we would have gone right in and sampled your lymph nodes and made a diagnosis utilizing a safer procedure, guaranteeing enough tissue for the molecular analysis that you're gonna need to be able to drive the specific therapy that you deserve and stage you all in one event, one anesthesia event not two procedures, not three procedures, not waiting every time to go see the doctor and then get scheduled for the procedure. And I see this continuously, and it's so frustrating. The, the pulmonologist should be the immediate quarterback, if you will, of where to go next. Um, because obviously, if I prove you don't have cancer, fantastic. Then I'm also glad that no one bothered to send you to see someone who deals with cancer. You don't even have that diagnosis, right? This is an ab I, I'm with you on this. It's an absolute <clears throat> um, huge area of f frustration and a, and a very large pain point for me and my colleagues. Agreed. And, and you mentioned time and, you know, I'm constantly thinking and putting myself in the shoes of, of the person who may or may not have lung cancer and time is not something that they feel like they want to waste. And so what you just said is a is a perfect segue into sort of the next piece that I want to talk about. But what I do want to reiterate is what you just said, um, whether it's an incidental finding and or maybe you were, you did the right thing and you went to an independent, you know, screening center and something was found, your very next step right. should be to find a pulmonologist to help you manage what the next step should be. And by next steps, it's either watch and wait, which we just talked about, or this biopsy diagnosis staging place. So let's talk a little bit about that and let's start with the biopsy place. And you mentioned, um, I think I think you said a fine needle aspiration. There are multiple types of biopsies. Can you talk about some of the different ways that we do access that tissue and how you choose the best method to access that tissue? Absolutely. So the, the goal always is what is the way to both make a diagnosis and stage you at the same time? So obviously there are the imaging that occurs, CAT scans and PET scans, but bear in mind as good as PET scans are and as good as CAT scans are, they are not the same as someone looking at a piece of the tissue from your lymph node proving there's not cancer there. And studies after studies have shown that PET scans, though very accurate, unfortunately under and over stage a patient. And when it comes to what stage you are, there needs to be no room for error. You are either a stage that's gonna be getting straight to surgery, or you need chemotherapy and radiation first, or you just need chemotherapy and radiation and there's not a role for surgery, et cetera. You know, I, that, that's an, most, probably the most important branch point. In fact, you know, one of the, you know, understandably when I, you know, I have a nodule, okay, is it cancer or not? Okay, once I prove it's cancer, that's my, you know, that's fine, I'm sorry, but, but the next almost more important question is, what stage am I? And everyone needs to understand that what stage you are is not some arbitrary, oh, the doctors have to fill out forms. No, what stage you are di dictates exactly what's going to happen next on your journey, whether you're getting chemo and radiation targeted therapies, et cetera, or whether you're going straight to the surgeon, or whether you're going straight to radiation, you know, et cetera, and everywhere in between. Um, and, it's a, and it's important because the staging guidelines keep changing as well as how we manage. This is 
thankfully, actually, a rapidly evolving area. And I say thankfully because some of the best advances that have been going on in cancer management have been, thank God, happening in the lung cancer world. So that we're doing better and better for our patients. But can you think of anything worse than someone telling you you're stage one and in reality you're stage three? Because I'll tell you what, when you get the treatment for stage one lung cancer, you're not going to do well because you were stage three from the beginning and we didn't treat you the right way. And someone, I see this all the time too, where they said, well, the one was negative. So he was stage one. You know what happens when you make assumptions, right? I know. So I want to know your stage one. And it's so easy to sample lymph nodes these days. And, you know, and I understand people that do advanced bronchoscopy. There's a lot of us in the U.S. We're maybe not in every single town. But I guarantee you, barring some really rural places, most Americans live within, within about a one to one and a half hour drive of someone who does this for a living. And no, you're not going to have to come see someone like me on a daily basis. I wouldn't want to drive like that constantly. But don't you think your health is worth one to two trips to make a long drive in to come see someone who does this for, the, for a living? Because it is going to dictate how you do. I think that's such an important point. Knowing what you're dealing with up front in the beginning um, is imperative to outcomes, quality of life, all of those things. So bronchoscopy, can you talk a little bit about EBUS or navigational bronchoscopy and how that technology sort of allows you um, to pull, whether it's bilateral lesions, lesions in one or more than one sort of lobe and or on either side of the chest, as well as um, some of those lymph nodes? Yeah, sure. And let's let's talk about this in the context of all the ways to sample the lung, right? So if you have a lung nodule, and let's say we need to sample it. So one way to do it, of course, is to go straight in with the surgeon and cut it out. And if we do know for a fact that you are early stage, that that there is absolutely no lymph node involvement, and that nodule's the risk of it being cancer is so high that and I and I have this discussion with patients. I say, look, you know, based on everything I'm seeing this sure looks like it's lung cancer. And, you know, I can go try to sample it and prove it to you. But to be honest with you, the risk is so high, you're, you're better served by just simply going in and have the surgeon, they'll do a sampling first. But once they prove it's cancer, go ahead and go straight to getting it removed because, you know, you're going to get both diagnosed and cured in the same stage or the same setting. But that's not always the case, and there's always enough questions as to whether or not it has, you know, based on the size of the, lo the lesion and its location as to whether or not we need to go sample all the lymph nodes first. Well, if I'm going to go in and sample all your lymph nodes, and we use an endobronchial ultrasound, so, you know, when you have a lung cancer up here, next question is, has it spread to any of the lymph nodes in the middle of the chest? That's the natural drainage. I need to go sample those lymph nodes. And we have a special scope, has an ultrasound on the end, lets me see through the walls, see the lymph nodes, pass instruments in, remove pieces. Depending on which lymph nodes are involved dictates what stage you are. And again, this is not some arbitrary thing of, oh, he just needs to go prove this. This dictates whether you're going to have surgery or not, whether you're getting chemotherapy or radiation first or second, after surgery, before surgery, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, God forbid you're in a more advanced stage or even if you're stage four, then we need to get the easiest amount of tissue. Do you really, you know, should you have a surgery to go prove that you're not an operative candidate? That, that sounds ridiculous. Why shouldn't we do the least invasive procedure that's guaranteed to get the molecular markers that your oncologist is going to need to treat your tumor, the thing that makes your tumor different than the other person's tumor? We need correct amount of tissue for that. And that's where we come in. Now, bronchoscopy also adds um, uh, a lot of new technology that's allowed us to get deeper into the lung. Um, we historically, go back 20 years, we had not as much to offer from a bronchoscopy perspective. But now we can reach all kinds of places and actually sample and prove if that's a cancer. Then, like I stated earlier, sample all your lymph nodes. So prove that you're a cancer, but also importantly prove that you're an early stage cancer. Now I can send you to the surgeon and you are going to have an operation. But you know exactly why you're going to have an operation because you have stage 1A lung cancer. We need to go get that thing cut out. Or because your lung function is maybe not good enough to tolerate a surgery, fine, you're going to go get radioactive, you know, radiation therapy to that spot. We're going to go take care of your lung cancer that way.
but we know we're going to have a good chance of curing it because it has not spread at all. Yet again, such an important point. We know that upwards of you know 40% of early stage lung cancers recur, right? And there's a, a multitude of reasons that that may or may not be happening. But if you're not properly staged up front, there's a big problem there. Until you look, everyone is stage one. And, and I'm going to give you a perfect example from my own practice literally a week ago. We navigated to a small lesion. I was about a centimeter in size, pet positive. It sure looked like it was going to be an early stage cancer. And we, and we biopsied it. Sure enough, it was a cancer, unfortunately. But hey, sure looks like you're early stage. You know, everything else was negative by the PET scan. And so, okay, now we know what we're dealing with. But we, you know, got moved our robot out of the way that had proved it was cancer. And now we go to do the staging. And the lymph nodes on CT scan and PET scan looked normal. And even on the ultrasound, when we looked with our scope, when you first just look, you're like, oh, that, this doesn't look like much, but you know, we, we take our samples because we need to prove it. And unfortunately, the lymph nodes were full of tumor. And this is a gentleman who, you know, before we did what we do, they would have resected his tumor and then his cancer would have, quote, recurred quote, six months later, and everyone would have said, oh man, lung cancer is so aggressive. But in reality, what he's got is advanced stage lung cancer. He needs to get chemotherapy. He's got a different prognosis, but now that we know what he's got, we're not wasting time giving him a false sense of, of we're going to cure you with surgery when he had a 0% chance of being cured by surgery. And it's only because we looked. And that's not some just, I mean, it's an anecdote, but, but the, the, the medical literature backs up that, that up to 10% of the time, these lymph nodes do contain tumor if you only look. And because looking is so easy now and so safe, it's an outpatient procedure. We go through your mouth. There's no cutting. Yeah, I, I agree. I, yeah, I agree. And I think it's, you know, rather than sort of the, old school of thought where you think it's an early stage cancer and, and the patient winds up in the operating room um, and if they are blessed enough to have a thoracic surgeon who's pulling enough lymph nodes up the chain to properly diagnose, then maybe that's how you would ultimately come out with a, oh, sorry, you weren't early stage. What we found is that you were lymph positive at X station, right? Um, whereas now, Prior to hitting that operating room, because of the technology and physicians like you, we're able to really take a deeper dive look without cutting anybody open and make that determination prior to whatever the first line therapy may be. I always hope you're stage one, but I'm going to go prove it. Um, and I never want to, but you know, and this goes other directions too, right? I mean, so do you know how many patients who've come to me with a PET scan that says they have more advanced stage? But there's lots of benign things that light up on a PET scan. So if we just used a PET scan to say, gosh, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, you are not a candidate for surgery because you clearly have advanced stage cancer. We go sample the lymph nodes and we prove that, okay, fine, you have cancer, but it was this stage one or two, not stage three that someone made the assumption. And again, you know, this is your health. This is your life. And this is about to be the biggest fight you've got in front of you. And we're going to make assumptions. Are you kidding me? Yep. No, I listen. We are, we are speaking the same language, Dr. Hogarth. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken yeah. to people who, to your earlier point, were told you were an early stage patient. We are doing surgery for curative, you know, with cur curative intent only a couple of months later to find out that they're metastatic. And of course this runs fear and, in patients about, well, maybe during the surgery, some rogue cell got out and then it just went crazy somewhere and all of this other stuff. No, but it's, it's like you said, it's not that. It's that we you were not yeah. staged appropriately. Yeah. And, and look, you know, unfortunately, lung cancer can be aggressive. We do, unfortunately, know some early, some true early stage cancers can recur. But if you've actually been staged appropriately, the probability of that is lower. And the thing is, too, there's some even better new tests. There's a new test that can be run on your tumor as it's resected that helps to predict if you're a higher risk for local recurrence. And based on that tissue test from the resection, 
could be used with your medical oncologist to help basically determine that you would be a good candidate for some, you know, you know chemotherapies. Like if you're a 1B, stage 1B, um, people frequently have not taken therapies after resection there. But I will tell you what, if this test from my tissue said I was a high risk for recurrence, I sure as heck would be doing it. Yeah, and I think there's so many things coming sort of down the pike right now, especially in this early stage, whether it's in the neoadjuvant or pre-surgical setting or the adjuvant post-surgical setting that all sort of play into this decision making based on where the patient actually is with all of these things factoring in. And technology, technology is amazing. And Dr. Hogarth and I, and he alluded to it at the beginning of this program, um, it's still continuing to happen. Tech, technology and advancements that are being made in this space are huge. And of course, they're not fast enough for people being diagnosed today, but there are things that you may or may not know about. And I think that's one of the our big hopes with this programming is that we'll be able to bring this to, again, those of you watching live or those of you who have come back to watch, you know, sort of food for thought and conversations to go back and have either with your, you know, your primary care physician who may be like, oh, you know, we saw something, but we're going to watch and wait for you to be able to say, well, I might feel a little more comfortable if you gave me a referral to a pulmonologist to get a second set of eyes on this. Right, especially when it focuses on lung nodules. And then the other thing, I think the other key to this, because this field is evolving so quickly, you know, understandably, um, if you've been diagnosed with a cancer, any cancer, you know, you, you talk to your friends, you talk to your family, and you find out suddenly, you know, my, my uncle had lung cancer, and you know, five years ago, and, and they talk about whatever he went through. Um, and a lot of things, you know, it, it helps to hear what someone went through five years ago, but, and it, cause it probably still applies today that can't, that's so almost beyond untrue with lung cancer. The journey someone went on five years ago is not necessarily the same as what's happening today. It really does. I mean, yes, you want to talk to people, you want to get information, but you need to be talking to experts, both from the diagnostic therapeutics and what stage you are and make sure you're getting all the appropriate therapies because this area is rapidly evolving. Literally what someone was getting even two years ago is not necessarily what we're doing today. The technology I use to diagnose and stage is already changing and evolving. That's what I spent today doing, trying to help develop some new stuff. There are therapeutics that are all being trialed right now that I will be using, things that I will put down the scope to try to either help cure your cancer or help the various therapies that you're getting through work better by augmenting the immune response. You know, the sky's the limit on what people are trying to do to help. And I think that's exciting to know that honestly, like, you know, if someone you know, you know, was had a, you know, a surgery or whatever and, and to, to cure lung cancer two years ago, even the surgical technique today is potentially going to be different than what they went through two years ago. Um, and so it's really exciting times. And I think it's really important. That's why you want to be up to date. That's why I love doing this. Every time you ask me ever to do these, I, you know, it's like half a second pause to make sure it's free on my calendar. I'm always happy to say yes. And we cannot thank you enough. And I know our, our, our patient and um, caregiver community thanks you also. Is there a way to find nodules outside of, um, you know, hopefully on a, on a chest x-ray or a CT scan, i.e. can you ever feel a nodule in your lungs similar to how you would in like breast cancer or maybe even liver cancer or something yeah what a great question the short the short answer the easy answer is no unfortunately uh, the way the lung is essentially wired we don't feel things inside of it unless it's touching very specific places or if a lung nodule is grown enough that it's causing blockages of airways or causing bleeding or pneumonias behind it so and, and even then you still don't quote feel it right you notice the symptoms you know related to the nodule so that is why, unfortunately, you will hear the story of someone, and, and this is, we see this all the time, where you know, they get in a car accident, like a true freak of nature car accident, and then they shoot an x-ray because they're you know, worried the shoulder's broken or, or whatever. And, uh, oh, there's a three centimeter mass in the upper right lung. Um, you know, the patient's like, I don't even have a cough. You know, I played basketball this morning, you know, or whatever. And that, unfortunately, is the norm. Um, and, and in fact, that's, you know, again, why lung cancer screening exists, um, precisely because of, for high risk patients, precisely because they have no symptoms is why we want to go looking. And uh, unlike, you know, mammography where, you know, and, and which adds to 
what a woman can do from a palpation and feel her breasts and know her breasts to look for lumps, et cetera, lumps. We don't have anything like that in the lungs. So I want to be mindful of time and I want to jump into treatments and what role you play um, in delivering cancer treatments directly to these nodules or tumors by way of ablation therapy, reducial marker placement, and we can start wherever wherever you want to. Well, one of the things we do, so when, for example, if you have a lung nodule and we've navigated out to it with, one, with our robot and proved it was malignant, We'll leave a fiducial marker behind because if you're going to be a candidate for, say, radiation therapy, this is quite literally like X marks the spot and it helps guide the radiation therapy. And look, if you're going to then go get the lung instead, that part of the lung is going to get resected. Well, the fiducial is not in the way and so it just comes out with the surgery. So great. But, you know, we left it there because if you need it for guidance for therapy, we, we, we want to do that. Obviously, then we stage you and we go from there. We also make sure you have enough molecular markers. But therapeutically, at the moment, things that we can do on the inside with the scope are all experimental. But the good news is what robotics has opened up. So, you know, we, we use the, the Monarch system from Oris. And one of the things that that has immediately opened up in our center is several clinical trials, um, different companies who allow us to... Uh, inject things into tumors. So some of these are radioactive seeds. Some of these are particles that make the tumor more sensitive to radiation. Some are viruses that can't replicate, but in, sort of infect the tumor and make the tumor more exposed to the immune system. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. And I think what's exciting is, is that there's a lot of basic science that says we can do this and help make a tumor more responsive to a drug or whatever. But we just got to figure out how to get it inside that lung nodule. Well, that's where I come in. So I'll get it there and we'll put it in and we'll go from there, right? Now, look, maybe these will help. Maybe they work. Maybe they won't work. There'll, there'll be trials that will go on. But something's got to stick here, right? And there's, a, there's an interesting technology that's going on. I'm, I'm going up to a lab in two weeks to use it because what it does is essentially, um, for lack of a better word, sort of shocks the tumor. And that helps to release a lot of antigens that your immune system uh, picks up and starts to attack the tumor on its own. Um, now, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work, but boy, if it does, how cool would that be? Where as we start to, you know, enter therapy, you are already got your immune system jump started to try to help you in your fight against cancer, you know? And I think this is what's so exciting. There's so many different things that are potentially optional, you know, that, that we can add. And, and it wouldn't be one or the other. It would be an add. Now, what you brought up is ablation. There, there's a trial starting this spring of for people that are not candidates for surgery and are not candidates for radiation therapy for whatever reason, that if we've navigated out to the lesion, we're going to put a microwave catheter in the middle of that thing and then quite literally step on the pedal and you get from the inside. Now, again, we want to need to prove it works and, and need to prove that we're helping you and not hurting you. Um, you know, the, the preliminary data would say that we do that. I, we need proof. And so that's where, you know, clinical trials will come in and people will volunteer and, you know, the, the advances of today are all on the shoulders of the volunteers of old, right? So please forgive me, those of you watching, because we, we kind of skipped over this very, very, very important piece when we were talking about pulling biopsies. We got so excited about the staging part, but your role in ensuring that there's enough tissue for comprehensive biomarker testing. So we have on site pathology in our room uh, that we're taking samples. And, and sure, we, we have them there. Obviously, it, it, it's, it's nice when I can tell someone, you know, good news, but that I can tell them that day. And that's always something I like to be able to give them an answer immediately. That, And in some cases, we can. In some cases, it needs to be processed further. But honestly, the biggest reason we have them there is to ensure that we get all the tissue we need right up front. So if you're presenting as a more advanced stage and we sample your lymph node and there's tumor there, we don't stop until we have enough tissue be able to not only prove what it is, but then all of the you know so-called molecular analysis, um, because I only want to go in once, um, and and, and then let you get started and get me out of the way. And the other role that I continue to play, though, is that uh, depending on where you are uh, with your lung cancer, if you're at a stage where they tell you that the current state of the therapies that you know they don't have any other current uh, standard of care therapies, and they start talking to you about research drugs, etc. Um, a lot of those trials, or at least more of them, are requiring fresh tissue. Well, if you've been through a couple of years of various therapies, um, you know, your 
your body has obviously also been through quite the fight. And you need an invasive way to go get more fresh tissue. So the other route that I still play is to help figure out what is going on. If, if they need to do a deeper analysis of your tumor to look for specific mutations to get you on some new drug. Unfortunately, not everybody gets to come out and see you at the University of Chicago and not every um, hospital or, or um, center has the benefit of having the pathologist right there in the operatory, right, to be able to right. ensure, because I think we're still hearing, although not as frequently, that we didn't get enough quality tissue to run the sample. It was either necrotic or, 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 or. And basically what you're saying is, ensuring that you're in a place where this type of um, um, treatment is and care is provided is worth the hour and a half drive because you don't doesn't mean that's where you need to go for your treatments forever but to ensure that all of the exactly. right things are happening um, is so very important it's a question always worth asking your doctor what are you going to do to make my diagnosis so um, i recently did another procedure on a gentleman and, and when the guy said he was going to do a bronchoscopy on him but it turns out the procedure they were going to do would not have remotely acquired enough tissue and would not have staged the patient. So thank goodness he ended up obviously coming for another opinion and you know, we got him in right away and, and got enough tissue to obviously diagnose stage and then run all the moleculars. It, it, there, there are more of us than you think um, and, uh, that do these kind of procedures. So if you are not in my state or city, um, um, please, you know, <laughs> look around. So there's several different options, the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy, as well as the American Association of Bronchoscopy and Interventional Pulmonary lists um, its members. We're in every state. Uh, we're in every major metropolitan area and worth the drive um, to get yourself taken care of appropriately. This is much like, um, you know, if you needed uh, a hip replacement, you don't go see the hand surgeon. Right? People are specialized for a reason. There are pulmonologists who specifically do bronchoscopy and specifically focus on lung cancer and lung cancer management. Um, your health is worth finding one of us, and, and there's a lot of resources. And obviously, you, you all have resources. Go to does to help get you in the right direction. Ask your doctors what they're going to be doing to diagnose and to stage you and to ensure. Do they have something called ROSE? If they don't know what ROSE is, go find another doctor. Um, because that means they're not going to be able to ensure they're getting enough tissue right up front to figure out what molecular therapies, et cetera, are, are you going to be available, are going to be available for you. You know, the thing is that maybe the good news, uh, uh, in the future, there's, uh, about at least five that I'm aware of companies that are working on automated ways to process the material at the uh, procedure and essentially, uh, use a lot of the, uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to look at the slide right away and, and be able to talk about adequacy and even make diagnostics or at least suggest diagnostics. So for centers that don't have on-site pathology, at least have something close to it that would provide obviously some benefit even for lower resourced areas. You mentioned clinical trials and there's a lot, we, we talk a lot in the living room about the importance of clinical trials. We thank all of those, of course, who have participated in clinical trials because without you, these discoveries actually would not right. be, they would not come to market. Are there any clinical trials right now directly um, infusing treatments via bronchoscopy into the tumor? And if there are, how might people find out about these trials if it's something that might be a good first step for them? Well, so clinicaltrials.gov will always, every every major, clin any clinical trial in the U.S. that's going to involve human beings needs to be listed on clinicaltrials.gov. And in fact, if it's not, then you ought to already be suspicious. Um, and so if you, that's your clinical warehouse for all things. So a lot of the things that are uh, going on right now where there's going to be direct infusions into tumors are in earlier stages. And so um, there's usually uh, like a lot of things, earlier stages of study, not, not necessarily earlier stages of tumor. Um, and so there's a lot of restrictions, like all trials. All trials have to be set up to, with some very specific parameters. Um, but uh, soon, in the near future, there'll be trials of directly injecting forms of chemotherapy into tumors, um, radioactive seeds, ablation catheters. There are already live trials right now where for more advanced disease, for people that are no longer responding to immunotherapy, we're part of a trial where we're injecting a virus into the tumor uh, that 
then the patient takes a medication that helps start to break down the now infectomer, and that causes um, the release of all the things inside that the immune system then goes and charges after and seems to create a nice immune response and help get the the checkpoint inhibitors back online, if you will, and, and help you know further with their management. Um, these are trials, though. Look, these might not work. These might harm you. Now, we don't think so. That's how they get to this stage, obviously, but it is still an unknown. Um, you know, but, and there's, and frequently there's, you know, you'll see and when I tell all my patients for any trial, whether this is a cancer trial or any other trial, read the consent, listen to the, what the doctor's talking about, um, decide if it's for you. And if it's not, if, if it's not, if you, what you read just doesn't gel with you, never sign up for a clinical trial that doesn't feel right to you. Don't do it for your doctor. Don't do it for anyone but you. If it feels right to you and it feels right for what it stands for and what you stand for, then sign up. Please sign up. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the, the world only advances based on the volunteerism of wonderful patients who are willing to do this. But it doesn't mean if you don't sign up that your doctor is going to treat you any differently. And, in fact, if your doctor starts giving you crap about not signing up for a trial, immediately find a new doctor because that person should never have any vested interest in the outcomes of a study ever whether they you know they've got you know involvement with the company or not they're you're their patient i'm part of clinical trials all the time that we're running for many different things and i tell patients like don't sign up sign up i don't care no i'm your doctor either way i'm offering this because i want to offer you all your choices but it makes no difference to me if you're in it or not um, to your point about clinicaltrials.gov, it is in fact a library of all clinical trials out there that are open uh, for enrollment. And I, although I think the best of intentions <laughs> have been laid there, it's not the easiest. Um, uh, no, correct. It is definitely. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, I do want to throw out, you know, a, a, a go-to plug here, and, and it's a plug I'm actually very proud of, and that's our lung match program where. Yep. We have clinical trial and treatment navigators at the ready to help you navigate and find trials that, that you do um, or may qualify for. So we're here to help and you can call, yep. you can call the helpline and we'll, we'll get you to those navigators. Okay, so the next Absolutely. question um, I think sort of opens up into the next sort, sort of segment. The, the question is sort of stated that once, you know, a person is through treatment and are seeing uh, their oncologist maybe for periodic scanning or follow-up scans, what role does a pulmonologist play in um, helping to maybe p potentially repair lungs, help alleviate, you know, symptoms? and or help sort of slow down progression of maybe some underlying other problems? Not obviously, everybody is different. So as, as, as you know, and as we know, and as everyone on this, this meeting knows, um, every individual person with lung cancers is unbelievably different. So some people do have underlying lung disease, whether that's smoking related or not. They might have other forms of lung disease. Some people also have underlying heart disease, et cetera. There's lots of different things that affect your health. Where, what I often see, and again, why you said from the beginning, what, what does the role of the pulmonologist place in here? So let's say, for example, you do have some COPD. Understandably, if someone tells you you have lung cancer, that becomes the singular focus of your life. But what I often see happen to a lot of patients, to their detriment, is they suddenly ignore every other aspect of their life. So they don't go get their mammogram, for example. They don't follow their diet and let their diabetes run rampant. They don't take care of their COPD because they're, you know, focused on their lung cancer. And again, I get that. That's a natural human response. There's no judgment here. But you really want to go through everything you're going to go through with cancer and win this fight and then succumb to a heart attack because you're out of control of diabetes and high blood pressure, right? For example, you know, uh, you, know you can't forget everything else. And so, what is what's the lung perspective here look if you have normal lung function stone cold normal lung function and no pulmonary symptoms and you go through and you get a lung cancer resection and afterwards after you recover from it you're good to go then honestly the only role the pulmonologist might play is that at some point the thoracic surgeon might go over to a lung nodule program because you know if you're six years out from thoracic surgery um, the thoracic surgeon just kind of doesn't want to see you anymore because you don't need them 
Um, and honestly, as you get surveillance CT scans, you know, a nodule might pop up again. And it's going to be the same discussion, you know, a little five millimeter nodule. Um, you know, that's going to be terrifying for a cancer survivor. But honestly, a five millimeter nodule, even in a cancer survivor, is very unlikely to be cancer. We need to have that same discussion of watch and wait, follow up scans again. So that's the role we play. Look, if your cancer is more advanced and as the tumor is progressing, for whatever reason, if it's pinching off an airway, it's our job to help both either dilate, debulk, or stent that airway so you can breathe better. If you've developed what's called a malignant pleural effusion and you have cancer cells and fluid filling up your test, chest cavity and squishing your lung and you can't breathe, we can get that fluid out of you and get it out of you in a way that helps to keep it out of you or various other procedures so that you can have better control over your breathing. You know, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And so where we play a role is to help keep you as comfortable as possible, no matter what's going on with the cancer and the various therapies involved. Is there sort of a, a baseline, like pulmonary function test that you do to determine lung capacity and ability to, to process oxygen? Absolutely. So if you, you know, if you have absolutely no lung history and you have an incidentally found cancer and, and you can tell us how you run up and down the stairs and so forth, someone might get lung function tests on you as a precursor to surgery as a checking a box. But to be honest with you, you've got you know great lung function, go have your surgery. But but frequently, of course, is that someone's in a little bit more of a gray zone. Um, you know, maybe I'm a lot of shape, maybe I haven't been as active, or maybe I have lung disease. They've told me once I had COPD or, you know, et cetera. Look, you know, uh, surgery is on the chest is a big deal, and I, we need to make sure that you can tolerate it. But the other reason to get pulmonary function tests and, more importantly, to see an actual thoracic surgeon for surgery is a number of patients who have been told, look, you're early stage, but you're not operable because your lung function is not good enough. And, and that, that may be true. That in some cases, unfortunately, that is true. But thankfully, radiation is actually a pretty darn good option. But if a thoracic surgeon who is excellent at the minimally invasive ability to remove less amount of lung, but yet still give you curative intent surgery for early cancers, and can prove that you actually are an operative candidate, there's some additional testing that can get done, um, then we want to do that. And, and you should do that. And that's where the PFTs come in. That's also where something called prehab, it's pulmonary rehab, but before surgery. I mean, look, a surgery is a planned insult to your body. And so is radiation. We are going to harm you, right? I mean, you're going to, anyone's had a surgery anywhere on their body. It hurts. You're beat up. Your body is injured. You need to be in optimal condition before that happens. And, you know, someone's like, well, I don't have three months to go get in shape. No, but you probably got a week or two that you can start to get walking again. Just get moving, even a little bit of movement. Drop a few pounds, right? Become very aggressive about those inhalers your pulmonologist has prescribed, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just get yourself best prepared physically and mentally for what you have to face in front of you. And you will fly through that treatment. Yeah, I think that prehabilitation space is so important, you know, as is that post sort of treatment space. And I know Bonnie, um, um, whom I think most of you know, is, is also my mom. So I've been walking side by side with her since her diagnosis in 2003. And, you know, she had from neoadjuvant or pre-surgical treatment of chemo radiation. Um, then right. surgery where they removed her upper left lobe and then intraoperative radiation. So a lot of that therapy caused some, you know, some, da some damage to her lungs. And she talks a lot um, about and believes wholeheartedly in medications that she uses daily to optimize the lung, the compromised lung function that she has due to all of the, the therapies. Can you talk a little bit about some of those medications and why, again, it's important to have you or someone like you in the life of a person diagnosed with lung cancer um, to help with some of those um, tertiary? Sure. Well, look, let's start with the simple thing. Let's start with pulmonary rehab. So pulmonary rehab is covered by your insurance and Medicare, and all this is is medically supervised exercise. You're worried about your lungs. You're worried about whether you can exercise. How about we do it in a very program specific way tailored to you that's monitored and help get you moving. I've watched people who are in need of a lung transplant who can barely walk, finish rehab, and are able to now walk several blocks. It's amazing what it can do for people. 
And so there's the, that's the simplest thing. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. Most of us are not in the best of physical shape. And this has nothing to do with your weight. This just has everything to do with whether or not you're at your maximum endurance capabilities. So you get that taken care of. Second thing, of course, is if you do have obstructed lung disease, you have any amount of COPD at all, there are fantastic inhalers that help increase the efficiency of your lungs. COPD robs you of the normal efficiency of breathing. These medications help improve that dramatically. And the thing is now, there's been so many great advancements even in that area. You say your doctor tried you on inhaler X and you know it, it gave you a bunch of side effects. Well, terrific, because inhaler X has three competitors. But we're going to find one of those that works for you, that you know insurance and works with you side effect wise to get you what you need, which is better breathing, et cetera, right? Um, any amount of weight loss helps the lungs because of that rib cage we talked about earlier that encases them. You've got to move those and you got to move that diaphragm down. And the bigger your belly, the more the diaphragm has to work harder. So any amount of weight loss is going to help with your breathing, pure and simple. Um, and then obviously if you're at the stage where you need oxygen, you don't only make your body weaker by robbing it of oxygen. You know, people will mistakenly say, well, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I want my body to get stronger. So I'm going to, you know, if I, if I deprive it of this, it'll get used to it. I wish it worked that way. Unfortunately, if you need oxygen and you go without it, you're only putting more risk to heart attacks, strokes, and more strain on your body and making it harder to repair things. So don't want to do that. Um, and then obviously vaccines. I know, again, Bonnie, my mom um, has at hand all the time is a, a pulse oximeter that you can get at, you know, REI or on Amazon that will measure the your, your oxygen levels um, in your blood so that it will kind of help you to identify when okay it might be time to you know look into oxygen and or if you already have it somebody needs to get me my oxygen because i'm i'm having some some trouble here oxygen's never going to be harmful to you let's say your, your oxygen level is adequate but you put it on you're just wasting it but that's fine who cares it's oxygen there, there are concentrators now too right where and i think there are different levels of oxygen and i'm and i Obviously, I'm deferring to you, but I'm, I'm basing this on on what Bonnie has, and she's got um, an oxygen concentrator that, um, when she is particularly in altitude, in altitude, and that's one thing that we didn't touch on. She she didn't recognize her need for oxygen until she got into some trouble at some higher altitudes where there's not as much oxygen in the air. And so, one of the things that we didn't discuss, but that um, is a service provided by your pulmonologist and or his or her team is these altitude tests to see at what point, right? Whether or not your lung function is fine, whether or not you, you, know, you may not need oxygen walking around at sea level, but you're going to go flying and that's a partially pressurized plane, or you're going to go visit that, you know, cousin of yours and who lives in the top of the mountain outside of Denver, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Right. Um, you know, you're a lung cancer survivor. That doesn't mean you're stuck at home now. It's time to get traveling. And um, um, we, we need to be able to know that you can travel safely. Yep, absolutely. And I think most people don't know, to your point about traveling by air, um, those cabins are pressurized yeah. at around 8,000 feet. So um, if, if, if your altitude um, you know, test shows that at 8,000 feet you don't do great, that's the time to talk uh, to your physician about utilization of oxygen. You, you don't want to be somewhere. You don't want to be somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean when you discover you need no, oxygen. No, you do not. Uh, uh, one last question: pulmonary rehabilitation sure. and um, whether or not there's a benefit for a stage four non-small cell lung cancer patient. Always. Easy answer. Um, and I hope that. Well, no. I mean, pulmonary get you moving. It gets you moving. It gets you breathing better. Yep. And um, someone with stage four cancer um, obviously has a huge fight in front of them and is going to be receiving all different kinds of therapies. And, you know, no matter how targeted all these things get and, uh, you know, when you're, when you're fighting against cancer, you're also at the same time having to deal with the things that we're putting in you, the radiation, the chemo, the targeted therapies, the immune therapies, et cetera, et cetera. All of those carry some level of toxicity. Variable degrees, obviously, but these are toxicities with a purpose, but it's still a challenge for your body. Give yourself always the best opportunity. This is why you need to get good sleep. This is why you need to eat a balanced diet. It doesn't mean you have to suddenly change your diet dramatically, but if your diet really was pure junk food, 
it is time to switch it over to something a little more balanced so that you're getting the nutrients you need. You're not putting on the extra fat. But the opposite is true too. This is not the time to stop eating. This is not the time to suddenly become super skinny, be below a normal weight, right? You, you need to maintain a healthy body weight. Um, one last comment I want to make, and I know, Dr. Hogarth, this is a big, um, um, important piece for you, is support. Yeah. And um, not, you know, folks not going through this alone. Um, go to, as you all know, and those of you who are new to us maybe don't know, we provide a lot of opportunities to connect you with other people, to connect you with us, um, programs, education, um, so that you don't feel like you're going through this alone. And, and, and I think, um, um, you know, through our helpline, which we've been kind of tossing up on the on the screen throughout this and also you know is available on our website we're here for you to help you navigate through any aspect um, of this disease wherever you are in your journey to help connect you with the support and education uh, and the tools that you need to ensure that you're putting your best foot forward and to dr hogar's point that your physician's putting his or her best foot 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 forward so um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Dr. Hogarth, before I close out, I don't know if you have any final thoughts or comments you want to share with everyone. My final thought is exactly what you said. Um, don't go through this journey alone. Um, you need friends, you need family, you need colleagues. Work with people. Um, take care of yourself. Focus on keeping yourself balanced in regards to your activity. Ask questions, ask lots of questions. And if you don't like the answer, Trust your gut. There's a reason why you're probably not liking the answer. Get a second opinion if you need it along the way, but make sure you're seeing people who actually specialize in diagnostics, therapeutics, and management of lung cancer. Um, huge thank you to um, Dr. Kyle Hogarth, who I consider a, a, a personal friend and a dear friend of the foundation, to the entire GoTo um, team for all the efforts that they put in day in and day out um, to try to improve uh, outcomes for those uh, diagnosed and living with lung cancer. Thank you to them. Of course, um, to our our supporters, Amgen, AstraZeneca, Boehringer, Ingelheim, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Daichi Sankyo, Isai, Foundation Medicine, Genentech, Merck, Novartis, Regeneron, Sanofi, and Takeda. Without your support and generosity, we would not be able to bring this programming to our community. So thank you all so very much. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave I'll be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see